I'm Joan Kerber Walker, and it is my privilege to work with an amazing team um, at AZ Bio, including our 280 member companies, and through them, over 300,000 Arizonans who are working to make life better for patients. And so as we have been celebrating Arizona Bioscience Week, um, we started a tradition a couple years ago because our industry exists to serve patients. So it's very, very important that we always listen to the voice of the patient so that we know what's important to them so that as we work to make their lives better, we stay on track. So I am thrilled to have all of you with us today. Wait until you hear our amazing spotlight speakers and panelists. Um, they're really going to make you more motivated than ever um, to be part of what we're doing today. Now you also see a picture of the pin on stage. And so up on the screen and on my jacket, there is an Arizona pin. So leaders across Arizona have accepted the challenge to double the life science industry in our state by 2033. That means when Michaela is standing up on this stage and telling everybody what a great job they did for hitting that goal, will you do that for me, Michaela? She says yes. Um, you know, we will all have been part of it. So I encourage you to take your pins that you have today and wear them. And when people ask you, why do you have that Arizona pin? You can say, I'm part of a community that's working to make life better for people in Arizona and across the world by supporting the biosciences. And together, we're going to do amazing things together. So with that, I would like to welcome our host for today and very special guest, Kevin Lohenry from the University of Arizona Health Sciences. Kevin? Well, good morning and happy Friday. On behalf of the University of Arizona, I want to welcome you to the Phoenix Bioscience Corps and to the University of Arizona Health Sciences. My name is Kevin Lohenry, and I'm currently serving as the interim dean for the newly approved College of Health Sciences here at the university. On a personal note, my family recently moved to Tucson from the valley, and we raised our three kids in the valley, so it's great to be back to Phoenix. I recall when the University of Arizona began to start to develop a presence, a stronger presence here in the city. I was leading a health sciences program at a local private university in town, and there were several outstanding faculty that left that university to come here and teach in the College of Medicine Phoenix, who are still here today teaching our next generation of physicians. We also have our R. Ken Coit College of Pharmacy, which has over 300 students, faculty, and staff here on this campus. The Zuckerman College of Public Health, which includes about 70 students. We have the College of Nursing teaching their BSN program at our Gilbert campus. And now the new College of Health Sciences, which has about 40 students in our clinical translational research program, our clinical translational sciences program. These students who are medical students, PhD and graduate students, are learning about translational research and how to apply it in the practice of clinical medicine. So it's a critically important field to us continuing to grow and find individualized solutions to patients' healthcare challenges. The newest planned addition on this campus is the Center for Advanced Molecular Immunological Therapies, or CAMI for short, because that's a very long name. And CAMI is where the future of healthcare will be impacted by the work done right here in the city. Our institution's strength in basic science, translational research, and clinical trials will allow the center to thrive and become a national leader in advancing immunotherapeutic breakthroughs here in the city. The long-term commitment from the University of Arizona here in the Valley is evident by the continued development of the healthcare team that we are all experiencing at some point in time in our life, and it will continue to grow with the future work from CAMI. I would also like to thank Joan Kerber Walker, her team, and the committee members for the kind invitation to speak with you today. The AZ Bio mission aligns with everything we're doing in the College of Health Sciences. 
Their focus on advocacy directly reflects what we're trying to do with our healthcare providers to equip them to be able to navigate and advocate for the communities and patients that they see. Their focus on workforce directly aligns with our expansion of the healthcare workforce that we're doing here in the College of Health Sciences and in Health Sciences for Arizona overall. And the educational work they do with the media enhances all of our knowledge and our understanding of the importance of bioscience. I thought I would take this time to briefly talk about patient safety and team-based care, two things that are near and dear to my heart. In 1990, I was a rescue swimmer with the United States Navy. I flew with a squadron from Point Magoo, California that trained with the Navy SEALs. We were the early version of Uber back then for these elite operators. They would use a very large satellite that's strapped to their back to call us in. We would find their location with a very, like I'm talking the earliest GPS that we had in society, which would get us about within 100 yards of the team. That's how good our phones are these days. And we would pick them up from their mission and bring them back to base safely. On one particular night, we were flying a training mission in the middle of the night with two helicopters full of Navy SEALs in the desert just east of San Diego. My job as the air crewman on the right side of the helicopter was to ensure that the rotor blades coming around the helicopter didn't hit anything when we landed. So I would, on our checklist, which we carried with us on our, on our thigh, I had a, a strapped in thigh checklist. My step was number one, clear the rotors on the right. My colleague on the left side of the helicopter would then clear the rotors on the left. And then I had to get on my belly and climb under the helicopter. I was strapped in to look underneath and make sure that we were safe to land. So on this particular mission of two helicopters, the two helicopters were coming in for a landing with the Navy SEALs on both helicopters. The first helicopter made their landing, and then my helicopter coming in, the blades were clear on the right, so the checklist was, was there. The blades were clear on the left. And then when I leaned underneath, I could tell that we were landing the belly of the helicopter on a large rock, and we were going to risk tipping over and crashing. So the command I was trained to give was wave off. I said wave off over the microphone and my headset and the pilot instinctively pulled the collective and began to fly around again. He came back down around, began to land in the exact same spot. Unknowingly, right, it's, we have night vision goggles on, it's a little hard with depth perception, particularly back in the 1990s. And so we went through the checklist again and I waved him off again. And at that point, he knew I was a rookie air crewman. He had been a flying helicopter for a while. So he pulled up into a hover over the rock. He used a few expletives towards me, and, and he asked my senior flight crewman to go check my work. And sure enough, this senior chief from Alabama scooted over, looked underneath, and said, yes, sir, we would have, we would have crashed. And, and so he did one more time around. I think about that when I think about patient safety because there was a pressure on this pilot in front of the SEALs, you know, this elite team of operators in front of his peer who was co-pilot on the helicopter, in front of the other pilots in the other helicopter who were probably laughing at us at the time. He had pressure, internal pressure, peer pressure to land and make the mission start and, and look like it's cool in a movie. And that just didn't happen on that day because we were following the checklist. He did apologize after the fact, which was great. It showed great humility as a leader, but it was an interesting lesson in life that I've always carried with me as a healthcare provider and an educator. Dr. Atul Gawande uses this same kind of example in life with his book, The Checklist Manifesto, where he took his observational skills as a surgeon and as a licensed pilot, and he began to recognize that patient safety and medical errors were occurring at significant rates, and he felt that was largely due to silos in our health professions and a lack of respect and, and, and communication among all the members of the healthcare team. So he suggested the use of a checklist in many of the things that we accomplish in healthcare to carefully avoid the steps that can cause errors and in fact create a process towards safety. One of those is really about interprofessional education. Healthcare is a team sport. It's led by physicians in many cases. Sometimes it's led by pharmacists, sometimes it's led by others. It depends on the scope of practice and the expertise of the individual at that moment in time. 
but ultimately when we learn with and from each other as healthcare providers, we learn to respect one another and understand the unique roles that we play and how we protect each other and most importantly protect our patients. When I trained at the University of Toronto in interprofessional education about a decade ago, the Canadians had been doing this for about a decade themselves, so they had a pretty good sense of interprofessionality. And I remember they had a model that had all the healthcare providers linked in a circle around the patient. But as Americans are known to do, we questioned the model because we looked at it and we said, well, where's the line to the patient? Why is the patient not linked by a line in this model, this diagram that somebody had created? And, and we had this long conversation about the, the metaphor of that, in that, you know, while we were progressing as a healthcare continuum in terms of working together more collaboratively and getting out of our silos as healthcare providers, we still weren't engaging with the patient and their families and their communities in the way that we probably should. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from many patients, caregivers, a few providers and students as well. And I suspect we're gonna hear the challenges they have experienced in navigating complex problems in our health system. I applaud the courage of our speakers for standing up and sharing their stories, which can be painful to bear. I myself have been on both sides of the white coat, having been a provider for many years and having a, a chronic immunologic condition that I had to get solved. So I can relate and, and I can have empathy with you. It is challenging to share our secrets, but it's through that secret telling that we all gain benefits and understanding and become more compassionate and become better healthcare providers and community caregivers as well. It is my sincere hope that the investments being made here in the state through the University of Arizona will impact our health and wellness in new and important ways. Collectively, we can make the world a better place. We can be better advocates. We can educate patients and, and the community about bioscience and truly engage the patients and the family in their health and wellness. Thank you very much. So we're gonna have our very special guests come up. And while they do, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the first time I met Mark and Leonard. So we were at um, the legislature and um, I was waiting and waiting and waiting for my turn to speak. And then Mark and Leonard got up and Leonard spoke. I've never been so nervous. Talk about a tough act to follow. So please welcome to this stage, Mark and Leonard. This is nice. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to share my story. Can everyone hear me all right? Good. Okay, great. Um, my name is Leonard Chidas, and I am living with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. I was 50 years old when my primary care doctor doctor that was that I was feeling fuzzy foggy and lightheaded I was not remembering things it felt like I was in a haze I would forget my grocery list I was not remembering my ATM pin number I was losing the, losing my wallet and I was losing my phone I was um, forgetting things at work I couldn't remember the alarm code and setting setting it off in the morning this was happening too much I didn't know why I was feeling this way I actually thought that maybe I had a brain tumor my PCP told me that I was just stressed and gave me some anxiety medicine because I did not know what was happening one of the things that I really didn't like was that I be began to isolate from friends, family, and even my partner. These were very difficult times. 
It took over three and a half years to finally get an initial diagnosis of MCI and another six months for full-blown younger onset when I was 54. At that time, I decided to face Alzheimer's head on. Today, I work hard to be part of life. It hasn't been easy. I need to have reminders for everything. One of the biggest challenges is to let people help me. I still want to do the things myself, but now I have to figure out how to do it. And I always, the way I used to do things naturally. Things take, things take at least half to, okay. Uh, twice as long before, then it probably, and then I'll probably make mistakes and have to redo and start over. And then I may just forget what I was trying to accomplish in the first place. I do not like to ask for help, but I know that if I don't ask, it often leads me to being frustrated, exhausted, and not happy with myself. I. I work at not getting frustrated and I focus on being happy. I want to enjoy my life. I have and I want to live it fully. I get concerned and quiet at times, but I try to remember everything that I am grateful for. I feel that I am fighting Alzheimer's at every turn, but I will not let it take away my joy away. I am going to enjoy my life, and I am going to help people around me, and I choose happiness. Thank you for letting me have this time and listening to me. Thank you. So my name is Mark Garrity. Um, Leonard and I have been together for 21 years. Um, and it, when it was, when, when the cognitive decline first started, it was really hard for us. Um, I, I didn't think he was paying attention. I didn't think he was vested in what we were doing. Um, and it, it was pretty, t I mean, it, consideration for splitting up was on the table. It was really, really tough. We didn't know what was going on. Um, and so after he let his PCP know that he was having these problems and he got into some some therapy and he was on some antidepressants and anxiety pills and after about a year nothing was changing and he was still isolating he was still um, having a real hard time coming home from work really frustrated so um, I started going to his PCP with him which went over like a lead balloon because who is this cocky old guy trying to tell me how to do my job um, because I was real insistent with the doctor that this isn't normal, this isn't right, this isn't, this isn't who he is. But, and the, the doctor did take offense um, because I kept showing up and he got snippier with me as time went by. But finally, he did make a referral to a, to a neurologist. Um, but he kept insisting that Leonard was just stressed. It was just stress. So we got to the neurologist, and lo and behold, the neurologist diagnosed him with anxiety and stress, which was really hard because it's like nobody's taking us seriously. Nobody's listening to us. Um, he, he actually did, and they never did. I don't know who this lady was, but this tech did like a, a short little mocha or MMSE on him. And even her, when he was doing the test, he couldn't remember what city we were in. We were in Phoenix here. And um, she stopped and she put her hand down and she says, really? So this was the, the interaction that we were having with the medical community. It was really difficult to, to work past that. It took about a year for us to finally, us, because we're in this together for us to get a referral for a neuropsych, and that's where the MCI was diagnosed. Um, we finally had somebody listening. Um, and fortunately, we found another neurologist that was 
um, specialized in, in memory care and um, Alzheimer's as well as any other dementias. And so things have really changed, but it took a long time. Um, I think the doctor, the first doctor took a while for him to finally come around and he's got a new PCP now as well, but, but he did finally apologize. But it's really hard when somebody's 50 years old, 51 years old. Ah, it's hard to talk about it. Um, and say that there's something wrong with them like that. It's, it, it doesn't fit the model. It doesn't fit what we're used to seeing. So it's kind of that listening for cues and, and understanding um, more broadly. You know, I get, I get on my soapbox, and, and I'm sorry I'm going to do it here too, but it's like we, we check our cholesterol. We check um, our sugar levels. We check our blood pressure. Um, and I know they're starting to do it with more senior aged patients, but a quick little, you know, mini, mini mocha kind of a thing, you know, the five words and draw a clock. Maybe that's all we need to do, but maybe something at all doctor's visits once a year, like we all get done every time we go in would be helpful. Um, but it makes it really a challenge. Um, Leonard talked about it not taking away his joy. One of his big joys in life is, is um, being social, um, making a difference. And with this diagnosis, we weren't sure how we were going to pull that off, but I needed to figure out ways to help him be successful. That's kind of my guiding light. Where can, what can I do to help him find his joy? What can I do to help him to, to add value to the world? And so he, he never says no to anything, so I have to run around behind him and tell him we got too much stuff on our table, we can't do it. But, <laughs> so don't ask him. But anyway, no, he will be glad. But um, we do a lot of this stuff, and we, it's turned into, it all started, the diagnosis for young onset Alzheimer's came down right before COVID, so everything shut down, and we had to, to integrate um, new friends because all of our friends started failing away um, because of the diagnosis and then with COVID. So we had to create a whole new life. And really, a, a lot of that was um, getting involved, um, advocating for the disease. Um, and so we do a lot of that. And, and I think we've been, that's given back to us so much. I mean, literally, um, we were truly honored because the Alzheimer's Association shipped us out to DC for their annual convention to meet with lawmakers and um, picket on the White House for CMS to get in their lane and start paying for Lakembi. Um, so that was like a huge experience that we would have never had. Um, so we're trying to, to make the positive out of it. And, that's Leonard's doing. I'm, I'm the one that's half got a glass half empty, and Leonard's got the glass half full. So it, it's his motivation and inspiration that really helps with all of this. Um, luckily, we've been able to get um, Leonard started on Lakempi. Um, we, even though it did finally get approved by CMS for coverage, but we, we went with the self-pay approach. Um, because there just wasn't enough movement by the government. So we decided we'd figure out how to pay for this stuff. And again, um, the stars aligned and, and the pharmaceutical company picked up the coverage of the drug for them. We're on the hook for the other stuff, but the drug itself is covered. So that's great news. And CMS will be covering it through Medicare. Um, we want to prolong this as long as we can and slow that progression because maybe there's there's a lot of people in this room that, that are working in the, the bioscience industry and so obviously there's stuff in the pipeline and so if we can keep him at an early stage, an earlier stage of progression, we hopefully can plug into the next best thing. So we really appreciate everything you guys do here. Um, it's really an honor that you want to hear from us. We're just, you know, some some folks down the block, and, and you guys are the ones with all the initials after your name. So um, it's really an honor, and I really want to thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, so please welcome to the stage our next panel led by AZ Bio board member Alex Tesmer. And um, he will introduce you to his panel, Claire Corey, PhD, George Gallagher, Mark Geiger. Let's give them a big hand. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Tesmer. I'm an associate uh, director for a company called Becton Dickinson. We're all about the patient first and about advancing the world of health. Uh, and one thing you might not know about me is, and I'm sure most of you, you know, at some point, we all become patients, right? And I found out uh, at an early age of 25 uh, that uh, I had hearing loss. And I kept saying what to my wife. And she's like, you gotta get in, you gotta get your ears checked out. I'm like, I'm 25 and I'm fine. Uh, but sure enough, I went into uh, the office of the clinic and uh, they diagnosed me. I had lost my high frequency range in my hearing. And it was primarily probably due to uh, going out to clubs and going to concerts, and then I had a loud stereo. So uh, I'm always telling them, I have four children, so I'm always telling them, be careful, because they like to li listen to loud music as well. Uh, you could lose your hearing. But I'm happy to be here today uh, to moderate my voice, patients as advocates. And so I'm gonna be asking questions here, uh, and we'll start off right here to the, to the right of me, and this is, um, Mark, and, the, the, and I'm going to ask each of this, so Mark, Claire, and George, and so here's the first question or statement. Please introduce yourself and share your story. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm in awe of some of the speakers earlier, so it's uh, certainly a tough act to follow. My name's Mark Geiger. Um, I work for Anuncia Medical here, headquartered in Scottsdale. Um, and um, I have hydrocephalus also. Hydrocephalus, as you may have heard our CEO talk yesterday, is an abnormal accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. Um, you, it affects children, but um, also adults. In fact, the aging population is, uh, is the fastest growing area of hydrocephalus. It can uh, be caused by spina bifida when you're born, or trauma, or hemorrhagic stroke, or any intraventricular hemorrhage, or a condition called no normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So you have essentially an implant rerouting fluid from inside of your brain through a small hole in the skull with a valve and draining that fluid into your peritoneal cavity, which, uh, where it's reabsorbed. But 50% of shunts fail in the first year or in the first two years, 80% in five years. And so it's not uncommon to find patients with five, 10, 15, 20, 30 shunt surgeries. I had five, I was diagnosed at 14. I had five revision surgeries, which is a hospitalization, changing out the plumbing, um, all in high school. And my last one was when I was 18 years old. So uh, I've been uh, doing well. Uh, relatively well since, uh, knock on wood. Um, and uh, talking about the team, someone mentioned earlier, the team approach is, is you know, without my mother <coughs> and family practitioner, I wouldn't be here. My mother kept saying, something's wrong. You're 14, you shouldn't be having headaches every day. And so I got diagnosed Friday night, had the shunt surgery uh, Saturday morning. And um, uh, it was a, it was a, tough road during high school, which is tough for everybody, but um, the good thing that came out of it is my mother said, you know what, you, you should work for one of these shunt companies. Um, I wanted to work for IBM um, in 1991, and uh, I got an entry-level job in customer service for a shunt company. My career now has been 32 years medical device, instruments, equipment, implants, a lot in CSF management. I've got a couple of US patents for uh, cerebral spinal fluid management. And it, it really changed my life. And I'm um, you know, very happy to be where I am. Um, I left a good job to come to this company because they, someone finally designed and developed a way to go after the number one cause for shunt revision, which is occlusion or clogging of the ventricular catheter. And I said, somebody finally did this, and I, I want to be a part of it. 
and uh, you know, very happy to be here. Thank you, Mark. And Claire? Hi, is this on? I guess so. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Claire, and uh, I have notes because chemo brain is real, <laughs> if any of you have had it. So um, here's a little of my story. A little more than six years ago, I noticed swelling um, in my right breast and unusual symptoms of redness. And I immediately called my doctor because I don't like to have my head in the sand. And she promptly sent me for a mammogram and an ultrasound. Within hours, I was given the all clear. No signs of malignancy and a recommendation to follow up in six months. But my doctor saved my life when she called me back for a second look and referred me for an MRI. Three weeks after I was told I was cancer free, I was diagnosed with stage 3B inflammatory breast cancer, also known as IBC. It's a very rare and aggressive disease. A 13 centimeter tumor had invaded my breast and it tunneled into my lymph nodes, all while hiding out from standard imaging. There is no stage one or two diagnosis for IBC. The earliest possible diagnosis is at stage three. Most of the time, and unlike other breast cancers, there's no lump. Mammograms and ultrasounds are typically ineffective for diagnosing IBC. What you need is an MRI. And it was hard for me to get it, <laughs> but I'll tell you about that in a few. I went through 16 rounds of chemo. I had a radical mastectomy. I had 25 lymph nodes removed, and then I had 33 rounds of radiation. I had an excellent treatment outcome, and I was declared NED, no evidence of disease. But then, <laughs> in the first weeks of 2021, the unimaginable happened. I was diagnosed with a second case of stage 3B IBC in my remaining breast. I'm one of a small number of people, probably fewer than five, who've had two primary cases of inflammatory breast cancer. For the second cancer, I did 20 rounds of chemo, and I had another radical mastectomy, and they took 38 lymph nodes. That's why my arm looks like this. I had 42 rounds of radiation, and for 18 months thereafter, I took daily oral chemo. As a result of the two cancers, I've been bald twice, and being immune compromised has become a way of life. Following 75 rounds of radiation directed at my chest, I wake up in a radiation straitjacket every day. I have lymphedema in both arms and hands, as you can see, and that has really changed my lifestyle a lot, particularly with exercise and recreational activities. This past July, a routine scan caught that old cancer on the loose again and now I'm a stage four metastatic breast cancer. It's also known as MBC, as some of you may know. I'm back in active treatment, but I get to keep my hair this time, <laughs> at least for now. And um, so far I'm doing pretty well with the side effects. I'm feeling good today. And I'm hoping that uh, the temperatures are gonna go down and that that'll give me a little break from all the lymphedema swelling. Well, good morning. My name is George, as it shows behind me very nicely. Uh, it was when I was 16 that I first began to notice depression, being depressed, not being my old self. And now, I just passed 66, so that's 50 years of living with major depressive disorder. And it comes and it goes. So in telling my story, I can say I was fortunate to be able to graduate from college. But I didn't have the GPA to go to med school, so I admire all of you. I have a degree in chemistry, and uh, my research advisor in college co-invented the transistor. So having the fact that you did research with a Nobel laureate really looks good on a resume. The fact that it's true looks better. <laughs> uh, 
But, but I see myself not as an el elder, if you forgive me, but as that same 21-year-old um, with just a holdover to transistors, a holdover to when IBM first came out with their PC, a holdover over to the Beatles, a holdover to the past. And I'm not alone in this. I think um, Bruce Springsteen is coming out for, for a concert. Is that right, Joan? Yeah. Oh, canceled. Well, somebody else who is big in the 70s will come out. <laughs> you can be sure. What I wanted to share to be a little quick on the whole depression side is that for me, with respect to biopharmaceuticals, it took a long time to develop what are now the SSRIs. And so for many years, I was a biomedical engineer, but I had too much of an anti-anxiety medication and nothing for depression. So that wasn't positive for a career. But I was on the Swan Gans team. For the folks at Beckton Dickinson, I made catheters for a long time. And then I became depressed. And then I started working for Beckman Instruments. And there, uh, once again, Dr. Beckman invented the spectrophotometer and the pH meter. And as a part of a team, we came up with a potassium ion selective electrode. And that's where I got my sole invention and disclosure. But now when they measure potassium anywhere in the world, I've got an ion in there. Okay. Finally, it wasn't until 1998 that I received a, a medication that could deal with the depression and also, from the perspective of biopharmaceuticals, they took us all off of Ativan or Lorazepam. So I don't know if, if you know, but Lorazepam was one of the most prescribed drugs, five prescribed drugs in the United States. And it was used to help all the people who were anxious at night about sleeping go to sleep. So it wasn't necessarily, it was a uh, moiety. But anyway, since 1998, when I received my disability recognition, I've been advocating for people with serious mental illness. And I'll talk more about that shortly. Thank you, George. For our next question for the panel, how important are patient voices in creating good policy? Great question. Um, I was lucky enough to be on the board of directors of a worldwide organization called the Hydrocephalus Association for six years in the early 2000s. I ran a couple of marathons to raise money for the Hydrocephalus Association, which is a 501c3 patient advocacy group. And we used to have a large meeting every couple of years for patients. And in moderating sessions and meeting parents and patients, you really see the impact um, in, in hydrocephalus. It's a $2 billion cost. Uh, it was a $2 billion cost to the healthcare system 10 years ago for all of these failed implants. In fact, our chief medical officer would say it's the most failed implanted technology ever. And um, the Hydrocephalus Association moved their headquarters from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. to help uh, be near the hill so that they could describe the impact of not just the patients and the cost of the healthcare system, but the impact to the families of all these repeat neurosurgical procedures um, um, that a lot of these patients and their families endured. So uh, having that voice through a patient advocacy group um, was very powerful. And, and having inviting uh, lawmakers and, uh, and the like to our shows, to different meetings, gave them that firsthand experience. Um, one, uh, one of Nancy, Nancy Pelosi's uh, top uh, aides had a son 
uh, name, or named Elijah with hydrocephalus, and he came to one of our meetings, and this child was fantastic, but um, the father, you know, got involved because he was impacted, and a lot of people here got into medical device because they have family members or they have, uh, they have a condition themselves that gets them the medical device, but it needs to be bigger than that. And, and I can't say enough about, you know, the concept of, especially for the young people here, why not me, why not now? Thank you. And Claire? So patient advocacy, I'm pretty emotional about that. And I can tell you, I would not be here today. I would not be alive today without patient advocacy. As recently as 2006, the life expectancy for inflammatory breast cancer from diagnosis to death was two years. Very little research funding was allocated to IBC. That still is the case because it was assumed that all the women were gonna die anyhow. Patient advocacy led to the creation of the IBC clinic at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And there's also one very determined survivor out there who established the IBC Network Foundation, which is the largest funder of IBC-specific research in the United States. The majority of breast cancer deaths, which is about 43,000 every year, are due to stage four disease but only about five to seven percent of breast cancer research funds are devoted to studying um, treatments for stage four metastatic breast cancer and even the smallest smidgen of that goes to inflammatory breast cancer but there is progress and it is due to the brave bold women who insisted on research for stage four patients Six, since 2016, the FDA has approved 10 new drugs for metastatic breast cancer, and I've been on one of them, and I expect to be on others in the future. I cannot convey in words my deep gratitude for the courageous women, many of whom are no longer with us, who spoke up. Their voices gave me more time. But we still need to move the needle. We need advocates out there. When I encountered my reoccurrence last summer, the number one recommendation from my treatment team was a clinical trial. I left that appointment with a folder full of information and a heart full of hope. Four hours later, I received a call telling me that I was not eligible for that clinical trial because I had inflammatory breast cancer. That was a gut punch. We. IBC ladies are typically excluded from breast cancer clinical trials because, among other things, we bring down the mortality rates. People of color are also disproportionately excluded from clinical trials. Everybody needs an opportunity for cutting edge cancer treatment. And I'll just sum up my thoughts about advocacy. I saw this on a poster at Banner. The true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Sometimes that's exactly what advocacy is about. Well, I'll start with a cliche, nothing about us without us. This has been a popular and true um, voice for advocacy. One of my early mentors shared with me here in Arizona that to be an advocate is to know the law as well as, if not better than, the person on the other side of the table. And so for my advocacy, it's been primarily at the state level. And as you all graduate, or as you all have lived through, we had a class action lawsuit to improve the quality of mental health care in the Valley. And that was 20 years ago. Now we're working with the, so that the judicial branch. Now we're looking with the legislative branch to improve the behavioral health care system in the Valley. And that's positive. There are ongoing surveys uh, about group homes and ongoing surveys 
about the crisis system from which we'll have data to make decisions to expand the community services. And then finally, the executive branch. We've been very fortunate, a group that I advocate with, to be invited to the governor's table and to work with her on an improvement plan for the Arizona State Hospital. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> and to kind of conclude very briefly, how can we best work together? Very quickly. Um, yeah, just a, a quick story. It's the connectivity and, and being here with all of these people. I, in, in hydrocephalus, is a very niche business that has a very large impact, but uh, famous story is two guys were watching a fire, a big fire in Santa Barbara on the hillside, one named Ted Heyer, another named Rudy Schulte, and they started saying, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm working in medical devices. What do you do? Oh, I'm a machinist from Germany working on small parts for watches and things like that. Really? Maybe you can help me because I'm trying to build this little valve that's an implanted device to control flow of CSF out of somebody's head. Maybe you can help me. And the company Hire Schulte was created and has impacted a lot of lives. It became American Hospital Products, which became Baxter, which has become a number of different things since then. And then other companies started to blossom, but it's that connectivity. And this was happenstance, right? But you, Arizona Bio, AZ Bio and organizations like it are making that deliberate of, you know, I was listening to Stan with the ponytail yesterday, couldn't wait to grab him after his talk to say, gosh, we should talk about inflammation and inflammatory mediators because, you know, we're doing some work in that space. Maybe we can help each other. And it's that connectivity that creates breakthrough technologies that help people. Thank you. And Claire. So a couple things that I think are really important, and um, I mentioned the MRI earlier that saved my life. It was really hard to get, and my doctor actually told me while she was fighting to get that STAT MRI approved, she said to call Senator McCain's office for support. And when a doctor orders a STAT MRI, you shouldn't have to appeal to the U.S. Senate. And so I'm hoping that we can move past some of that. The other thing is that I've gotten a lot of specialty care at the IBC clinic at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, probably saved my life because there's very unique treatment protocol for IBC. Many oncologists only see one or two cases in their career, and if you don't see a lot of cases, you're not really familiar with it. But a lot of insurances don't allow people to travel out of state for specialty care, so we need to fix that. That's that's really, really critical. The other thing is that um, I love the technologies. They're awesome. Um, I've, I'm a three-time chemo port person. Wouldn't go anywhere without that chemo port. We got to make sure that the technologies include everybody. And then my last final thought. I've been a cancer patient for more than six years now. And I will tell you that it's the little things that matter. And they matter a lot. And so I know medicine's really, really specialized, but I just want to say, can we add more, one more specialty? And that's to specialize in kindness. I can tell you that I have undergone very painful, stressful, difficult procedures that I actually remember fondly because I was treated so well. You know? And conversely, you never forget when you're treated poorly. And so, I know that this may sound a little crazy, but you know when you go to Dutch Brothers and, and they're all so happy to see you and they have a big smile on their face and they ask you how you're doing. And I really would love to see the Dutch Brothers model integrated into healthcare because it can make such a difference just to have somebody smile and say, hey, how you doing? And so um, I, that's my recommendation. I would love it. And those are the things that me as a cancer patient that I will remember. Thank you, Claire. And George? So Joe Biden walked the picket lines. Well, good for him. 
our, uh, and, and that is not a plug for Joe Biden, that is to say that his leadership is focusing on health care and better health care here in the United States. And the way that he's engaging people is what's called peer support. So you'll hear a lot of talk about engaging peers, and these are people with lived experience. So as you do your work and you hear there's a peer support person, I ask you to please welcome them. The other way that we can really work together is to vote. And then a third way that we can work together is know what legislative district you're in. Say that's legislative district five and dog your legislators. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, George. That wraps up our panel. Thank you, Alex and panel. That was terrific. So as we get our next special guest to come on up, the thing that is so amazing about you know the conversations that we hear and, and we saw you know when when Mark and Leonard were up here, you know the importance of having not just a patient go through the journey, but having the caregiver there to be part of that journey too. And um, when I had the opportunity to meet our next speaker, um, one of the things that I got was so thrilled about was I didn't meet just Michaela. I got to meet her family. Um, and her mom and her grandma and her grandpa are here with us today. Um, the journey of a patient is easier when there are people around them that love them. Would you please give Michaela's family a round of applause? Uh, so I'm Dr. Pasternak. I'm actually uh, Michaela's physician, and I was asked to join her here um, today. I actually, well, first they, they told us to sit up here and act as if we're just out to lunch and have a conversation, but I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> um, and I, I, after hearing the talks earlier, I totally changed um, everything I was going to say. Uh, so it's a little bit longer than, than when it started. Um, but since, since this uh, event is about the voice of the patient. Um, I'm definitely gonna let our superstar, or my superstar patient, Michaela, tell her story. She's had quite a uh, journey and battle, but um, I've never met anyone uh, stronger. Her TikTok page spoke volumes about her character, and um, she'll explain why I use past tense. Um, and uh, her perseverance and her maturity for her age is uh, unparalleled, uh, but to preface the story, I myself have, uh, I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease when I was in college, and um, like many people who spoke earlier, that diagnosis shaped my my career, my life. Um, so it, it, rather than suffer from the disease and let it, let it control me, um, I've let it fuel me and my passion in uh, and devoting my life to treating children with um, inflammatory bowel disease, as well as um, get involved in uh, research and, and advocacy. Um, and as earlier uh, mentioned, also to, to be kind. Um, I, I, I couldn't have said that better myself. I think Claire um, really touched on an important thing that I try to teach our um, residents and, uh, and medical students. I'm at Phoenix Children's, um, and I always tell them that I would much rather have uh, a physician who is empathetic and has a great bedside manner than the highest board score in the world. Um, and and um, i not saying I had a terrible board score, but, <laughs> but, but I think that the, what's really shaped, I think, my career and, and, and 
made me have passion and love what I do is connecting with my patients and, and, and listening to them and being on their level as opposed to getting offended if a family member comes in and says, uh, there's something wrong, I think we're missing something. I, the parents are always right. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's, it's, if they say something's wrong, something's wrong, and it's our job to figure it out. Um, so, did you hear that? I saw you point to your mom. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, like, like Leonard, um, I also have a hard time saying no, but advocacy, mentorship, and helping these amazing kids is, is worth it. Um, I never realized how much we can make a difference. Um, and Shannon, um, Shannon knows I am knee deep in, she dragged me into this advocacy ring and I am like knee deep in, in advocacy, um, realizing how important it is, again, alluding to, to Claire's comments earlier, um, how important it is to, to make sure that what we are choosing for our patients as physicians is what's done and not being dictated by payers, um, insurers, etc. cetera. Um, I've got a, a new manuscript that's gonna be coming out that's, that's gonna be, that's pretty informative and, and interesting. Um, recently uh, met with Bernie Sanders' team about some legislation that they're hopefully not putting out regarding uh, inflammatory bowel disease and care. And, and it's been really amazing just seeing that you can get to that level um, and, and be involved and, and fight for, for what's right. Um, and it turns out kids were never even considered in any of this legislation when it comes to a lot of these bills. So um, anyway, um, I actually just found out about this association through Shannon um, and been looking through the website and seeing everyone involved and, and um, it's fascinating, and I definitely think there needs to be more collaboration um, with, with us, with, with the pediatric realm, and, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but anyway, that's, this was like a lot shorter before, but you guys gave me a lot to think about and talk about. So I am not, I am not the highlighted speaker. We'll pass it over to Michaela. All right, so... I know most people talk about the day that they were diagnosed as a day they will never forget, but the day I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease is a day I will never remember. I was five years old and my biggest concerns were monsters under the bed and getting my list to Santa on time. Five is a tough age to be diagnosed with Crohn's disease, especially when bathroom humor is the height of comedy in kindergarten class. The word poof would send all my friends into fits and giggles for, for hours. But poof was my number one concern for me and my parents. My mom tells me she took me to the doctor just to be told I was being stubborn about going to the bathroom at school and that the, my lack of di appetite was a type, typical kid thing. She said they recommended Miralax and sent us home. I can. I continued to lose weight and was in constant pain. It took another two months before I had the first of what would be many colonoscopies and finally got the answers we were looking for, Crohn's disease. We tried a few medications before we landed on Remicade and for four years, we, things went very well. But then, as often happened, my body started to fight the medication and I had some pretty big setbacks. The doctor talked about changing medications, but at this point, I had an actual voice in my treatment. After all, I was 10 now and had a lot of opinions. I had followed people on social media with Crohn's and was learning all about the different ways to treat my disease in addition to the medication including nutrition and mental health. My doctor told me that my parents, my doctor told my parents that putting a kid on a restricted diet was a waste of time and to focus on the meds. I rolled my eyes a lot during this consult. <laughs> it was around then that my parents heard about a pediatric gastroenterologist that was great at treating kids with a whole body approach not just the IBD aspect. 
And that was how I met this guy right here. He had his work cut out for him with me. Immediately after we went, I suffered seizures, fractures from osteoporosis, fistulas, and hair loss. He assembled the warriors immediately, and suddenly I had a dermatologist, neurologist, endocrinologist, nutritionist, and psychologist. We talked about meds, but we talked about meds, but we also talked about the other ways to treat this disease. I was only a kid, but he actually talked to me. Asked my opinions and recommendations, he treated me with respect and included me in every step. Here we are with just a few ways. <laughs> Here are just a few ways he has supported me over the years. That in addition to his medication re recommendations, have helped me get where I am. He encouraged me to go to Camp Oasis, a summer camp for kids with IBD. I was unsure about going away th th without my parents, but I found out Dr. P would be there. I said, sign me up. Best decision I ever made. He also connected me with a junior IBD board that raises awareness and funds for IBD research. I had a TikTok account that I used to document my journey and raise awareness about IBD that gained 30,000 followers. It was eventually banned due to my age, but Dr. P fought to get it back, stating it was a great outlet for me to share my journey. It didn't work, but I appreciated the effort. <laughs> he has fought my battles with the insurance companies, and when I started asking questions about surgery that could help, he actually listened to me. I followed many people with IBD on social media and learned the benefits of these surgeries. And despite my sources, he never made fun of me. I had the colectomy last February and have felt great ever since. I have grown three inches and started ice skating and rollerblading again. Don't tell my endocrinologist. Apparently not the best pastimes for those with osteoporosis. Long story short, the name of this conference is the voice of the patient, but sometimes it is hard as a kid to have your voice heard. But I think my generation is underestimated in our knowledge and awareness. In this age of social media, we connect with fellow warriors and share our experiences. We learn about new treatments, nutrition, and connect on a deeper level. Listen to these kids. We need more doctors like Dr. Pasternak here. Doctors that collaborate and partner with their kids in their care and become their voice when others won't listen. I am a part of a generation that has grown up with this technology and know how to use it to improve our care and knowledge. After all, if you trust us how to convert a PDF and attach it to an email, you can trust us to be a voice in our own care. Thank you. That was terrific, Michaela. And um, And who knows, maybe someday you'll be able to join our next panel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome Taylor Hoffman and her panel. These are medical students that have stories to share with you. So my name is Taylor Hoffman, and I actually did this, the Voice of the Patient panel last year. And that was one of the first public um, events that I told my story, so I'll keep it short because it's on YouTube forever. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, when I was 18 months old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That was a time where CGMs were not a thing, <laughs> insulin pumps were not a thing. Um, we used archaic little, um, you could like adjust your blood glucose numbers and then it would tell you how much you should bolus and I don't, you guys probably don't even know what that is. Um, but then when I was five years old, I was diagnosed with celiac disease. And then when I was almost 13, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. And then when I was 20, 22, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. 
So I kind of have that, that joke on an Anki card here in med school that is like somebody who has all these problems, what's wrong with them? So all my friends think of me when they see that one. Um, and so it's, really, it's been important to me since I was young to talk about how important it is to listen to patients and the realities of the struggles that they go through because it is a physical, um, it's a physical thing that we go through. However, there's so many complexities to healthcare and you know, I would, if I could get my supplies on time and get the quantity that I need when I'm supposed to get it, that would take a huge burden off of me and I would keep the diabetes if I could just guarantee that everything would go right. Um, so, for this year, we thought that it would be a great idea to have med students who also have some sort of chronic disease to talk about how that has impacted their career choice, but also what it's been like to be a patient and then go through the process of becoming a doctor. So, if you guys could introduce yourselves and tell a little bit about your story. Hi, my name is Ariana Toomey. I am a Pathway Scholar student at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, which means that um, the Pathway Scholars program is a program for students who want to be doctors but have experienced greater than average challenges or difficulties in applying to medical school or going through college. Um, regarding my story, when I was 18, I was a student at the University of California, San Diego. I was in my second year, and I was feeling very tired all the time. Um, it lasted for about two weeks and got to the point where I couldn't go to class anymore. I was sleeping 20 hours a day, and when I was awake, I was extremely nauseous. I was vomiting all the time. So after two weeks of this, my roommate said, you need to go to student health. And I said, you're probably right. So one of my roommates walked me to student health. And what should be a 10 minute walk from our dorm took me 30 minutes because I couldn't breathe. Um, and when I got to student health, I saw the large waiting room full of people. And I took a seat, got a ticket to be in line, and then the people who worked at the clinic saw me and they said, oh, come back to triage right now. Uh, they could tell that something was very wrong. By the time the doctor came to see me at Student Health, he also knew that something was very wrong and he immediately called an ambulance and sent me to the ER. When I got to the ER, they had no idea what was going on. Um, they threw around a few things. I had a chest x-ray. They were very worried because my oxygen levels were low. And so they sent me to the ICU. I was in the ICU for two days. And eventually, they told me that I had type 1 diabetes. Um, you would think that that would be an easier diagnosis because I was experiencing all of the telltale symptoms. But I was in pretty severe diabetic ketoacidosis at this point, which is a complication of undiagnosed or uh, poorly controlled diabetes. So it, it was quite the journey for me, but um, I was diagnosed, I spent another two or so days in the hospital, and from that point, everything changed. I now had a chronic disease to deal with on top of school. I was already having um, a lot of difficulties in school because it was, the diabetes had been building for the the past few months, and it just exploded when I was diagnosed. Um, so it was really difficult to, though I was feeling better, manage diabetes on top of school. And I was in school for pre-med studies, um, and it's very hard to get into medical school, as I sure you, I'm sure you all know, but that really didn't help. So after graduating, um, I had to take some time and um, do some work before applying to medical school to really make my application uh, at the same level as other people who didn't have to deal with that kind of setback. And that's why I'm really happy I found the U of A Phoenix Pathway Scholar Program because they really understood that just because my GPA wasn't the same as everyone else's or my MCAT score wasn't as great as everyone else's, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be a great doctor. I just had a few things setting me back. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you.
Hello. Hi, my name is Nina Cherian. I am a first year medical student at UA Com P. Um, when I was 12, I noticed that I couldn't see very well. I've always been viciously nearsighted in my right eye. That's just the way it is. Um, so I really leaned on my left eye. That was my 2020 eye, 2015 on a good day. I was very proud of it. Um, and in the seventh grade, I realized that I couldn't see the back of the, or from the back of the classroom, I couldn't see the board anymore. And it took, side note, I really love the stories so far about family members advocating for their, you know, loved ones who are saying something's wrong and people are like, oh, you're stressed or, oh, it's nothing, you know, it's normal. Um, I was having all these vision problems. My optometrist gave me bifocals as a 12 year old, which is not, I don't know how many 12 year olds you guys know with bifocals, but the number is small and it didn't really help my situation. And my mom fought tooth and nail to get me to see a specialist and I was soon diagnosed with um, chronic autoimmune uveitis, which is essentially inflammation in the eye. Um, there's like a big ball of, of clear jelly in your eye and I had a, a whole mess of cells floating around in there and I couldn't see. Um, I lost about 80% of vision in my left eye and since that was my, you know, my good eye, I couldn't really see very much at all. Um, and then treatment started. So treatment was a bit of a tumultuous road. I was put on a newly approved medication called Durazol, which is a steroidal eye drop. And that seemed to work really, really well for a while, but then my eye pressure shot up. And eye pressure, just like blood pressure, or any other kind of pressure shouldn't be too high because bad things can happen. Um, and my doctor was adding medication after medication to try and control my eye pressure, and soon I was at risk for developing glaucoma as a 13-year-old, which is not something that you, you know, you don't want to, you don't, you want to avoid that. Um, so it came to a point where the medications that I was on, they were causing intense fatigue. I wasn't able to walk around. My parents and I, um, I grew up near Seattle. We traveled to UCLA for a second opinion. And we went to Universal Studios because my parents wanted to add some, some fun to the trip. And I couldn't walk around the park because I was so tired from all the medications. So we talked to our physician and we got the second opinion and I ended up having a surgery um, that essentially took out the ball of jelly in my eye and replaced it with just a clear solution. And things were fine for a little bit. I had a flare up the next year and um, knock on wood, everything has been okay. I was cleared of the disease when I was 22 and now I'm 26, so things have been great. Um, I have had to make some lifestyle changes. I have a little baby cataract in my left eye that I'll have to get taken out sooner than most people have cataract surgery. Um, I'm a black belt in karate. That was a huge part of my life for a long time. I used to travel and compete, and I had to give up competing and sparring because it just wasn't safe. Um, but this, I mean, that whole experience is the reason that I, I wanted to become a doctor and go to medical school. I loved hearing Michaela talk about her experiences with Dr. Pasternak because I had the same kind of experiences. My doctor would look at me and he had this model of the eye that he would bring out and show me what was going on and I felt just like the smartest person in the world after I saw him because I knew what was going on. And it's very empowering even as a child to know what's going on with you when something's not right. Um, so that's why I'm here and maybe we'll get into details later but grateful to be able to share with you guys. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kelly Walter. Um, so I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 19. Um, ulcerative colitis is a different form of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and I was a sophomore in college, um, and I started noticing that I was getting tired. Like I was really, I played soccer, so I was exercising all the time, but I just couldn't run as much as I used to. Like I'd get really winded. Um, and my sophomore year of college also happened to be 2020. Um, so this was the beginning of 2020. I noticed myself starting to get really winded all the time. And I made an appointment with the doctor at the end of March. However, as we all know, um, the pandemic hit and that appointment was canceled and I stayed in Boston. My family's in Chicago, so I was living by myself and I just was getting worse. Um, but I was like, there's a lot of other worse things going on in the world than my own health issues. I'm a healthy 19 year old other than this. Um, 
But finally in May, at the end of May, I woke up one morning and was like, I don't feel well. I had a fever, I was super lightheaded all the time and I made an appointment with a PCP. And I was, she was like, you can go in and get some blood work. And I was like, they're not gonna let me in, I have a fever. And they're all gonna think I have COVID. And she's like, you could go in through this back door. Like she really set it up for me. And I got some blood work that day, went home, and I got a call at 10.30 that night saying, your hemoglobin is five, you need to go to the emergency room right now. Um, and so I went to the emergency room, and got two blood transfusions. Um, felt great. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I went and got a colonoscopy and got diagnosed, was put on steroids. Um, had some lovely physicians. I, that physician that originally like snuck me into the, um, her office to get blood work, um, she wasn't accepting new patients, but I just told everyone she was my PCP um, and she kept me on for the time I was in college. Um, and yeah, after two months of steroids, I was put on Remicade. Um, and after a year of that, my insurance company was like, we don't like Remicade, you're gonna go on Inflectra, which is the same drug, just a different company. Um, but I do know all of the biologics, so I really appreciate the um, biotech that went into developing those. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Um, you know, there's a lot to unpack in each one of your stories, but one question that came to mind was, um, how ha what barriers have you experienced when, whether it was getting that procedure or getting, um, how did the process go when it came to getting your Omnipod and your Dexcom and then you as well with that biologic? I know that those processes can take a, a long time and you have to deal with the prior auths, rejections, reapplications, and just the, the mouse wheel of all of that. So if you can share what that was like. Sure, I'm glad you asked that because it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, so I first tried to get an insulin pump to control my diabetes about two years after I was diagnosed and my endocrinologist was very supportive. She understood that I wanted the one tubeless um, insulin pump, the Omnipod, which I now have. Uh, but this was back in 2016, going on to 2017. So things were a bit different then. Um, so she originally uh, you know, wrote a letter to my insurance asking if I could get the Omnipod. They said no. She submitted an appeal. They said no. She did something that I really appreciated, but maybe wasn't uh, <laughs> technically the, the right thing to do. But she said that I was in very active water sports, and I would have to be disconnected from my pump if I got a tubed pump. This was not true. I barely swim. Um, but I really appreciated it, because she was, at this point, desperate to get me the technology that I wanted, that I would have to wear on my body 24-7. And this was the one that I wanted, and she tried to make that happen. They still said no. I was placed on a different insulin pump with a tube. Um, I stayed with that for a few years. I really didn't like it. Um, but even just that point, getting me to the pump that, the one pump that my, in, uh, my insurance company approved, took six months. So this is six months of me taking insulin shots multiple times a day, not wanting to do it. I was in college, graduating college, turning 21, um, going traveling with my friends. It's not the time where you want to be pulling out your insulin pen, pen and giving shots. Um, so as a result, my diabetes really suffered. My A1C went up a lot in those six months. And part of that was just stress. It was so stressful. You know, every time that the insurance company shot down the appeal, I was really hurt. Like I cried many times during this process. And um, though eventually, uh, I think three years later, I was able to get the Omnipod pump that I wanted, it took three years, right? Um, and all of that was just because the insurance company decided that was what they wanted to cover, and this was something they didn't want to cover. And that has such intense emotional and physical effects on patients. So. 
That's something that I still, still deal with today, even with getting the type of insulin that I like to use, that changes. I was on one type for many years, and then all of a sudden, the insurance company said, we're actually not gonna cover that anymore. We're gonna switch you to this different brand. Um, and sometimes, you know, luckily for me, that insulin seems to work with my body, but for some people, that's not the case. So, insurance is a necessary evil, I think. Um, but it's, it's really something that if we're here to do the best for our patients, we should take a look at um, those kind of policies and see what is really going to be the best for them. So that's all I have to say. Um, I think I was very lucky in terms of access. I grew up in you know, Bellevue, Washington, near Seattle, which is a hot spot for biomed. There are great hospital systems there. Um, I was on really great health insurance because of my parents, and thankfully I, you know, I was diagnosed young, so I didn't have to worry about insurance. But um, it's, I, so I think I was very lucky in terms of my personal access. I, we didn't have to deal with a lot of insurance issues. The main barrier that I saw was something that I've been hearing from quite a few of the speakers today was just that initial, you know, not really believing that there was something deeper or more insidious at play here and that it was just, oh, you know, you need bifocals. Like, your vision is bad, you need bifocals. Um, but I, I'm gonna keep it short too because I feel like I, I wanna give room to, to y'all. Um, uveitis is one of the most common causes of preventable blindness across the globe. Um, I come from India. It's a huge issue in India, and one of the biggest reasons for that is poor screening. And thankfully, you know, I was able to go to an optometrist every year to get my eyes checked. Granted, you know, we weren't able to figure out what was going on after the screenings for some time. Um, but I at least had the access to see someone. Vision screening is something that a lot of people aren't really aware of. I talk to people all the time who haven't gotten their, adults who haven't gotten their eyes checked in years, so if you haven't gotten your eyes checked in a while, go get your eyes checked, it's important. Um, but it's something that, you know, a lot of people just don't know about and they don't know that it's something that's important that they should be doing. And if they do know it's important and they should be doing it, sometimes they just don't have the access. Um, ophthalmology procedures and medications and visits are expensive. They are so expensive. And I worked in um, clinical trials for uveitis patients for a while and we had a lot of people who came in that didn't have insurance, and they had to self-pay for, you know, visits that took half an hour and cost them 700 plus dollars, and that doesn't even include the medications or scans or anything like that. Um, so that's huge. I totally agree. We need to, you know, re-examine policies. Things just shouldn't cost that much, you know, like medicine has become more um, monetized, and that's just the direction the world is going, it seems, but it, it definitely poses a problem where, you know, money is posing a barrier to people's health because I do believe in equitable access when it comes to healthcare for everyone. And I think um, we just need to start looking at that a little bit more closely. Thank you. Yeah, I was also similarly lucky that I was diagnosed young, so I still have a few more years of my parents' insurance. Um, but I also was fortunate that I got my original colonoscopy in Illinois, and that doctor prescribed me um, mesalamine, which is like just a pill. Um, it's usually for people with like more um, moderate or mild uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, and then when I went to Boston, that doctor said, oh, well, she failed that drug because she's still sick, um, which that takes into step therapy where a lot of, um, with a lot of diseases, you have to fail a drug in order to get one that actually works. Um, so I ended up only actually taking that for a week. Um, so I was allowed to get the biologic covered by my insurance. Um, but um, yeah, when I was originally on Remicade, um, my insurance covered it right away, it was fine. But then after eight months, they were like, oh, well, we don't like your infusion center. Like, you can't go to the hospital that's right down the street from your house. You have to go somewhere 30 minutes away. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I have a car, it's fine. But then they were like, oh, well, we also don't like your brand of drug. So now you have to change that too. And it sounds simple, but it's like, well, they even have the drug. You have to talk to the specialty pharmacy and make sure it gets sent to the right place. And 
Um, luckily, I was going every eight weeks at that point, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but then, um, as Michaela talked about, um, with this drug, you can develop antibodies. Um, and so there's a test for that. And the test, I think, costs like $1,500 or $2,500. Um, and my doctor was like, for the first time, he was able to get it down to 75 after I got the $1,500 bill for a one, one tube of blood. Um, but then my last appointment with him before I moved, he's like, I want to check it again. But the um, company that runs this test, they're not making it go to $75 anymore. So since you're doing fine right now, even though I'd like to check your blood level, I'm, we can't because you might get a bill for $2,000 and I don't want that to happen to you. So yeah, I think um, just access to healthcare, like even though I'm fortunate and I have insurance, there's still things like that that it just, you never know what bill you're gonna get. I mean, my medicine costs $7,000 every six weeks. Um, and there was, a, like, luckily the drug company pays for it, but there was a while where I had, like, an outstanding $5,000 bill um, that I just kept getting because um, the um, uh, fee assistance plan and the um, specialty pharmacy hadn't um, reconciled the charge, but I just was like, I'm not going to pay that. I don't have that money, so <laughs> I just kept getting the bill um, until it was fixed, but... Um, I think you guys bring up some, some good points about um, what equitable access to care looks like because you can, you know, be blessed in that you are given a prescription, but once that prescription leaves the iCloud or whatever and goes off into this mystery universe, the chances of you being able to get that drug, that biologic that is life-changing, so for example, I'm on uh, Enbrel, and if I wasn't on that, I don't know what my life would look like. The pain every day was, you know, mentally out of everything, so debilitating. And so um, I think that as future physicians, even if you had the, the privilege of being able to get access to it, um, I think that having that awareness of how difficult it is to get and knowing workarounds, like saying, you know, they're a water polo player and they've never been in a pool. Like, I think that that, there are, it sounds crazy, but if it's the only way to help your patients, I think that, you know, it's unfortunately just a part of the game that you have to play. Um, one of the other questions that I had was, a kind of funny thing about being a med student is you have to learn about all of the different diseases, right? And so you have to learn about, um, for example, why it happens, or different theories as to why things happen, um, different ways that they approach medicine, and you know, theories for biologics and how they would work and prevent the progression of a disease or even cure it. Um, I think that that can be really hard to sit there and read a textbook and hear from your professors about all of the things that you that can go wrong and then over the course of your life you can experience and then you have to translate that to your patients so you have to know this in order to educate your patients and keep them as healthy as possible but how as med students who have to then share that information how do you read about, I could, for example, diabetes, I could go blind, have neuropathy, and then all the complications of um, inflammatory bowel disease, and then even your eye condition if it came back. How do you guys like reconcile being able to deal with that personally, but then also translate that to your patients? Yeah, so all three of us just started medical school in July, so um, I'm lucky enough to be able to answer this question because in our first major block class, we did talk about type 1 diabetes briefly um, in the autoimmune section of our course. And when we got to that section, it was um, very quick. I know we're going to go into more detail in the second year, uh, which I'm looking forward to. But in that brief overview, I felt a lot of generalizations and this was because we don't have enough time, we don't have the capabilities to memorize every single thing about this extremely complicated disease that the experts don't even know a lot about at this point um, in, in this class where we're also learning tons of other things. But I, when I was sitting in that lecture, I really wanted to 
get up there and ask the professor, like, hey, can I talk about this a little bit? Um, I didn't because, again, we don't have time to listen to all of that. But if anything, it made me more reassured with the path that I've taken. I thought I knew why I wanted to be a doctor when I started college, but I really didn't until I was diagnosed with diabetes. And that experience as a patient is what really led to my passion to be, to be a physician. And that's what keeps me going today. And so I know that as part of this, we're going to have to sit through some difficult things. And to me, it's, it's really worth it, even though it's not the type of overview I would have wanted to give or not the type of things I would have wanted to highlight. I think just the fact that someone's talking about it is really important. Um, something else that I would like to see included in our curriculum, even if it's just talks like this, is including the patient perspective for some of these. And we do have patient seminars every now and again where they, they can come and talk about their diagnoses. And I think that really makes a difference in creating that kind of kind physician, that empathy that is so necessary, maybe one of the most important things in being a doctor. Um, we haven't started talking about the I in school yet, <laughs> and I'm very excited about that. Um, and I hope they talk about uveitis, because I love talking about uveitis. Um, but I... Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, and I'm excited to hear about that, and I am kind of curious to see how it's how it's going to be explained because you know when you're you know when I'm a patient and I'm sitting in the clinic having a condition explained to me they're not necessarily talking about you know um, <laughs> the cascade of proteins that leads to my condition you know I was 12 I don't know what a protein is um, but it's it's interesting that I feel like learning about some of these other conditions that we've learned about in our you know three months of med school so far. Um, it's easy to feel like you, you know, you read it, you watch a video, you're like, oh, I know what's going on. Like, I have an understanding of this. And then you talk to someone who has a condition, and there are all of these factors that you haven't considered at all. Um, and I think that's, that's the key, right? Like, being able to listen to patients in the panels that we have as part of our curriculum or interact with people at some of the clinics where you can volunteer as a medical student to actually learn what it looks like on the other side. Because as we've heard today, Everyone's experience, there are common traits, but there are a lot of nuanced differences too. And that's what makes, I think that's what makes a good doctor. Like you have to be able to cater to the person sitting in front of you, you know, like avoiding generalizations, avoiding treating everyone like a disease and rather looking, you know, at them as a person with a condition that you're trying to help them through and not the disease itself. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about uveitis and I hope that I get to meet more people with the condition so I can learn more about it because my own experience is my own, but the people that I got to work with at the clinic that I was at for a few years, tons of them, I mean, most of them had worse disease than I did and that was really eye-opening. Um, statistically, I was told that I was never gonna meet another uveitis patient in my lifetime and I'm very grateful to have met like 300 since I worked at that clinic for a couple years. Um, and I, kind of, I wish that we could just meet everyone who has a condition that we're learning about in school, because I think that's where you learn like the heart of the, the content, because understanding the concept is one thing, understanding what it looks like and how it affects a person is a totally different thing. I think one thing I realized is you really never know who you're in a room with. Like for me, I like to think that you can't really tell I have ulcerative colitis, and I think that's true for a lot of people with a lot of conditions. Um, and I remember, our, I think it was our second, we have this case-based instruction, and it was a breast cancer case, but one of the siblings had ulcerative colitis. And I was like, of course, there it is, week two of med school. And one of my classmates was like, oh yeah, that brother has colon cancer. And I was like, I thank you for the reminder that I'm at a high risk for colon cancer, but um, <laughs> it is in fact not colon cancer. Um, and. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I've told some of my classmates, but it's not something that I just like broadcast everywhere. But when it does get brought up, I'm, it's interesting to hear other people's views. And sometimes, like I've told classmates that I haven't, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I appreciate that, but this is my life. So um, I think that happens with multiple conditions. Like if Nina, I knew Nina had uveitis because she told me, but... Um, <laughs> 
when we get there, a lot of people probably won't, and they'll be like, oh, there's all these horrible side effects, but it's just our lives. So I think kind of keeping that in mind, at least for myself as well, um, is really big because you really just never know um, what someone else is going through. Uh, just to add one thing that I just thought of, um, terminology is really important. So in medical school, we, or just in the general zeitgeist, we refer to uh, if you have diabetes, you are a diabetic, um, as opposed to a person with diabetes. We don't say, we say like a person with cancer, right? That small difference is really important to people who live with these chronic conditions because you're putting the person first and not the disease. So that's also something that I would like to see improved upon in general. So we are about out of time, but we could talk about this all day long or all week or all year, depending on the, how we're feeling that day. Um, but I think one thing to just wrap it up is that um, U of A has done a lot to put patients at the center of care, and I think every single year there are new projects that are coming out that are talking about um, why we do what we do, which is to help patients, and even Cami. It was funny, when the first time I heard about it, I remember telling my mom, I came up with that idea first when I was like six, you know? <laughs> like the impact of um, molecular therapies and um, how important the immune system is to every single disease that we learn about, talk about, and that all of you may have come across in your lifetime. Um, and I think that that's an important and significant you know, part of this medical school experience and then all of the experience that we can then provide to um, you know, programs like CAMI, and then even in our doctoring program, we all have unique perspectives because we've been there, um, not including family members who have also had conditions. And so I think that um, having panels like this and including the medical student community is a way to, you know, forge a way forward where there's innovation and then also progression to, um, I guess, start righting some of the wrongs of the past when it comes to how we approach patients. So thank you for having us. All right, so as we bring up our final speaker for today, he's gonna come on, come on up and join me on stage. Um, please welcome Dr. Amish Shaw, member of the Arizona House of Representatives. Long time no see. Yeah, <laughs> great to see you again. So, um, for all of you in the audience, um, we have here at the state of Arizona in the legislature the Bioscience and Healthcare Caucus. And that is where members of the legislature are able to look at various topics that they're interested in learning about, and then members of the community come in and, and share with them. And our, um, my co-panelist today is co-chair of the Arizona Bioscience and Healthcare Caucus, and also wears a lot of different hats and does a lot of different things. So I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about himself. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Um, so my name is Misha. I am an emergency physician. I am still currently in practice. I'm at the Mayo Clinic. I'm also at the Dignity Hospitals. Uh, I since getting into politics seven years ago, I've worked clinically throughout the time, including throughout the entire pandemic, about one day a week now, <laughs> because there's a lot of other stuff going on uh, that, that I do. So I've, uh, I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from Chicago originally. I went to Northwestern for undergrad and med school, kind of moved around the country a little bit. Uh, I had an academic, I practiced in academic settings. I was at Mount Sinai on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I was a faculty member there. I taught medical students and residents and did some, you know, published some peer-reviewed research and stuff. I worked for the National Football League for a little while. 
I was with this organization called the New York Jets, and they were terrible, and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> and I used to, I was in that first cadre of physicians who stood on the 30-yard line right out of bounds in case something horrible happened. And part of my job was uh, to deal with that, but also we dealt with standardizing emergency care with all 32 teams across the league. So it's a great project. And they actually said, look, if you want to further your career, go get board certified and get a sports medicine fellowship. So I came to the U of A in 2012, board certified in sports medicine, fell in love with Arizona, decided not to go back to New York, and I've been practicing here ever since. So uh, clinically uh, independent practice basically for the last, uh, I don't know how many years, 12 years. Um, but about seven years ago, started to feel like the system was not treating patients well. Politics itself was less than inspiring. And, and so it felt like somebody needed to step up in, in order to try to make a difference. And, and really, from purely from a sense of public service, I, I ran for office. So the way I did this was very unique and different. Um, I could have, I think, I make more money than the average bear, or I did at that time, not anymore. <laughs> so I could have just thrown marketing material at people and said, hey, I'm this doctor, you know, that's, that's great, vote for me. That's not what I wanted to do. I felt as though people were really disconnected and people didn't hear their stories. Like I heard the, the medical students that were just up here talking about making people feel as, as though they're, you're seeing the person. Well, what are we doing to the voter? Are we doing that to voters? Are we just sending marketing material and ads at them? So to that point, I personally cut back my practice to one day a week and I started knocking on doors. and. I knocked my first campaign for 18 straight months, five days a week, from 10 a.m. to sunset, 8,034 doors, not volunteers, me, and show up at these doors over and over again and um, build relationships with people, communicate with people, listen to what they actually had to say, and give them opportunities to contact me. So I won my first election in a landslide, right? Everybody thought I was the dark horse, and you know I'd never done anything in politics before, but crushed everybody in the race. And now I've gone on to win three in a row, right? Which, which is great. Always with the same attitude. I've knocked on 15,000 doors personally and I continue to knock. So I'm knocking almost every single day uh, out there. And then you're saying, well, when you get in there, what are you gonna do? Well, instead of just, I, again, there, there's another style of politics where you can just get on social media or make pretty speeches and drone on and on, kind of like I'm doing now. Uh, but, but instead, I went on a door knocking campaign inside the Capitol. So every Democrat, every Republican, House and Senate, and I went and spoke to them personally. And I said, I'd just like to get to know you and know who you are and what you stand for and what you care about. And that's the beginning of building relationships. That process took time. At first, people were suspicious, especially in the other party. They're like, who is this guy? And Ultimately, they, they realized it's time and trust and reputation that all I cared about was making good policy. And, and that's what government kind of should be. Uh, not necessarily the flashiest person, but a workhorse who's, who's willing to go down there, hustle, listen to people, and actually make things happen. So we've had a Republican legislature for the last five years. Um, I'm a Democrat, but I have had more bills signed into law than any member of my party in over a decade. And that's 12 bills that are not just license plate bills, but these were real policy wins for the people of Arizona. And, and a lot of these bills came directly from constituents that I met, you know, people who said, there's a problem here, let's solve this problem, and I worked with people to get those things done. Um, those are just the bills in my name. We had a tons of bills that I don't think should have seen the light of day, and we made sure of that. Um, and, and of course, I'm the only physician in the legislature at this point. So a lot of this is the ability to also talk to my fellow legislators, and, and I think Joan appreciates me the absolute most for exactly this point, is talking to them about what you guys all do, what, what biosciences are, being factual, not rhetorical about these kinds of issues, and, and this really resonates. So yes, I, I do have a lot of friends across the aisle who, who actually trust me and work with me and, and, and I've been able to do this. So nine bills through Doug Ducey, three through government, uh, Governor Hobbs, and, and I'm really proud of that record for that. I've won over a dozen awards, many of them from Joan Kerber Walker, but, but also from 
really a lot of healthcare organizations, also non-healthcare kind of stuff from all over the state. And, and I'm proud to say I'm also endorsed by 21 of my colleagues from across the state. Um, and then that's a, that's, a, that's a fairly large number of people for my, my current endeavor. So I, that's, that's a little bit of, of what I've been up to over the last few years. I've, I've tried to sort of talk about burnout specifically as one big umbrella that, that the healthcare sector is suffering from. We're losing workforce. Uh, physicians are, aren't super happy. Nurses aren't super happy. I'm very close. The Arizona Medical Association, the Arizona Nurses Association, all of the healthcare organizations in the state, be, because I'm I'm trying to be your voice, their voice, right? Um, so it's it's a point of pride to me to represent our entire industry and to be a champion for it. And and so anyway, I I thank you for the opportunity to be here and introduce myself. And, you know, on behalf of our patient community, we really want to thank you. So what a lot of you talked about today, right, the challenges of prior authorizations, the challenges of copay accumulators, the challenges of step therapy, the challenge that your biomarker test is not paid for, um, those are the types of policies that Dr. Shaw has worked on at, during his time at the state legislature. And when he says that his voice is respected as the only physician, and, and at one time you did have another physician there. My first two In years. the first year. Um, but at, as the sole physician voice of the legislature, he is the go-to person. So when I will go in and, um, Hopefully, I get an equal hearing at the legislature because I have a unique position in being the voice of our patients, our physicians, our hospitals, our health innovator companies. They're all part of AZ Bio. So when I go in, I'm pretty much Switzerland. They can ask me, what's, you know, how, what's the take from this perspective? or this perspective, or that perspective, and it's my job to, to be as open and honest about that, and they don't always agree. Um, Dr. Shaw has the same responsibility. He is the person that either side of the aisle will go to and say, okay, you know, is this really the deal? Is this really an issue? Um, you know, and, and then having to explain it to, to someone who medicine is not their first career choice and hasn't been exposed to the same things that you and I have been exposed to. How do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis and be so effective? Um, so it, it, it involves, a, a lot of it is the, the background, right? Is, is treating, first of all, build relationships. The, the best way to do that is to treat people with dignity and kindness and respect and patience <laughs> and, and listen to what they have to say, what perspective they came from. Uh, I, I think it's what, what I found when I first got down there was a culture of tribalism and groupthink and I, you know, people on one side of the aisle wouldn't talk to people on the other side of the aisle. A lot of people don't. I mean, you, I'll ask, ask some of the people down there, do you have one friend on the other side of the aisle? And they'll tell you they don't. And I guess I didn't really understand that. So full disclosure, my parents are big Republicans, and my sister and I are Democrats, and, you know, we have, we have nice Thanksgivings, right? <laughs> we had the, I would say probably like a couple of years ago, we had... You know, and maybe maybe more than a few years ago, we we had a little more contentious uh, time of it, and we've learned to to respect and understand one another. And if we can do that at our dinner table, I can't understand why I can't do that when I go to work with some level of professionalism. Really, I mean, this this red jersey, blue jersey thing, it's got to stop. I mean, it, it's not it's not helpful. And people, I think the voters and the people can recognize a lot of it. Um, nonetheless, so this, this is the background of, of, to answer your question. And, and then it's what I talked about is that you, you've got to know what you're talking about and then be able to be factual about all of it and not rhetorical. So if people think that you're coming at it from your own point of view and your agenda, they, they're less likely to then trust you on it, but you can separate those two out by saying, look, here are the facts, right? Here's why, here's, here's what I know, right, as far as how I see it, 
and here's my recommendation. Kind of like what we do in medicine anyway, right? And say, okay, look, here's, here's my, I'm gonna give you now my opinion, and I think you should vote this way, but you can take that or leave it, but here are the facts, and these are separate, we're having separate sort of conversations. So I think some of that really starts to build trust in the way you can uh, influence, say, somebody's vote or decision making. So um, you alluded to, you know, kind of your next project, and you've been extremely successful in driving policy and good policy in a legislative body of 90 people, 60 in the House and 30 in the Senate. Um, now you set, you know, kind of a more aggressive goal. Um, so I'd like you to share what that goal is and then tell me how you think and how we can help you if you achieve that goal of doing the same thing when you're dealing with almost 500 people. Sure, certainly. So the, the goal <laughs> that she is subtly alluding to is that in April, on April 1st of this year, I announced my intention to run for United States Congress for Congressional District Number 1. So uh, we've been in the race for about six months now, and um, <clears throat> it's going great. We've, we've, you know, part of it is knocking on doors, which I mentioned. Part of it is raising money, um, which we've also done really well. And um, it, uh, why am I doing this? Because we are trying to take this very same approach, listening to people, getting to know them, build relationships, uh, including you know, the voters at large, as well as people in groups like this, and, and then take their voices to the federal level. A lot more of healthcare policy happens at the federal level, and, and again, being my area of expertise, this I think is, is sort of missing up there, and I would really love to be somebody who makes the world a better place by, by advocating for us up there. Um, and um, it, it's, um, I, I don't know what it's like to work there because yes, there's 90 legislators here, there's 535 plus the president and the administration up there. So it's, good. it's, a, bigger, it's a bigger deal, it's a bigger stage, right? But my hope is that the same way in which I was able to build trust and relationships here, I can do the same thing up there and hopefully try to make meaningful, a bigger meaningful impact for the entire country. Because I think it's sorely needed at this time. And I agree. I think that if we put the needs of the patient first, and these are the lenses that AZ Bio uses when we look at policy. So the first lens is, is it good for patients? It has to pass that sniff test. The second is, is it good for the overall healthcare system, right? Is it good for patients and is it gonna be done in such a way that we're not gonna bankrupt everybody? And then the third is looking at our specific industry and, and what are the things that might be needed for our specific industry. But patients first, health and delivery second, industry third. And what we found is if you have those very clear lenses in your advocacy, whether you are an elected leader or someone representing a community or the advocate that's knocking on the door to speak to the elected leader, know what your lens is. What is your perspective that you're going to be talking about? Be factual, be honest, be willing to share but most importantly, you just got to knock on the door and show up. And this is a prime example of what happens when you do. Would you please join me in thanking Dr. Shaw? All right, so we are going to be wrapping up the formal presentations. I see there's still some snacks back there, so please feel free to help yourself. Um, and I'll be around for a little while. Dr. Shaw, you have a couple minutes to talk to people afterwards? I would be happy to just... <laughs> couple minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. get to the we hospital. I tomorrow. Know. Yeah, no, I'm actually not in the hospital today or tomorrow, but our FEC quarter deadline is tomorrow. Oh, and so okay. That, that is why many of us who are running for Congress are working especially hard today and tomorrow. All so, right. Yeah. Well, I have never reached out to Dr. Shaw on something important and asked for his help that he didn't come through and you came through again. Thank you so much. All right, bye everybody.